doubt has become one of the great virtues of Western culture. It's seen as a healthy skepticism towards myth and tradition and old wives' tales. And there's something really important about it. A preparedness to challenge received truths, to speak truth to power or to challenge dogma is an important thing. But I think there's a danger to it. Because doubt is not an end in itself. Rene Descartes, the famous philosopher known for saying, I think, therefore I am, set out to doubt everything. But he did so in order to establish truth. Our culture is in danger of being more like Pontius Pilate, who said, What is truth? And so this is the story of the wonderful doubting Thomas and the way that he established what truth really was. I don't know if you saw the context of where we are in the story. So last week we were celebrating Easter morning and the wonderful Mary Magdalene and her going to tell the disciples what was going on. But our reading began that same day so it was the evening of easter day and where are the disciples did you see they are locked in a room out of fear which is really interesting isn't it despite the the rumors of resurrection they are still terrified and doubting and unsure of everything and they're locked away in a room verse 19 they're confused and afraid and have locked the doors they live in a dark and scary world And their anxiety is natural. But something changes everything. And that is the presence of the resurrected Christ. Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, peace be with you. And we, I think, like them, live in a a world full of anxiety and darkness. And you will know some of that fear. And perhaps if you want to take nothing else from this sermon, those words are for you. In the presence of the resurrected Jesus, Jesus arrives and says, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. It's going to be okay. The presence of Jesus is the answer to our fears. And of course, that's transformative for all of the disciples. They go from being uh, scared to bold and confident witnesses to who Jesus is. Their lives are utterly transformed at that point. But I say all of them because did you notice? Not all of them are present. I don't know where Thomas had gone. He just wasn't there. If you are the sort of person who has a tendency to be late for important things, you've got nothing on Thomas. He missed the resurrection. Can you imagine how he felt when he got back and uh, they were all, they'd all gone from being terrified to jubilant and they said Jesus was here and they go, Thomas was like, what? How is this possible? What do you mean Jesus was here? Thomas though is a really interesting character and a really important character I think in the gospel story. We don't know very much about him, but we do get some little insights into his personality, and they are significant, and um, they tell us something about why he was struggling with this. Let me give you two examples, two little moments in the gospel stories where we see something of Thomas's character. So the first is when Jesus was preparing them for the fact that he was going to leave them. And he said that famous line, Jesus said, in my father's house are many rooms. And it's Thomas who replies. And um, he's clearly not great with metaphors because he's like, if we don't know where you're going, how are we going to know the way? Do you see, does that sort of give a little insight into the sort of person that he is? Don't give me these airy fairy pictures. We don't know which way to go, says Thomas. There's another moment where... Jesus is saying, let's go back to this place which had been very dangerous the last time they were there. And the rest of the disciples were like, well, we don't want to go back there. It's really dangerous. And Thomas says, 
let's go with him that we might die with him. Now, I don't know what that says about Thomas. I'm not quite sure what that means. He's certainly loyal. You could say he's brave. I think there's something slightly resigned, almost melancholic about that. He's committed to Jesus. Let's go with him, even if we end up dying with him. I think he's a fascinating character, and you might be able to relate to something of who he is. And I think that gives some insight into his refusal to believe. When he arrives back and he says, well, what did I miss? And they say, oh, Jesus was here. We have seen the Lord. Thomas says in verse 25, I will not believe. And I use that word deliberately. I think that's quite interesting because we often talk about faith as something that some people have and others don't. Sometimes people say to me, oh, I wish I had your faith. And, um, but there's that, this really important sense here that belief is a choice that we make. And for Thomas, the evidence simply wasn't sufficient. He wanted something more empirical. And, um, and he was clear about what, what it was going to take. Do you see? He said, I'm, unless I put my finger in the wounds, I will not believe, says Thomas. Fascinating question for you, is he? Well, what would it be for you? A week passes. Thomas lives with, has to live with all of this unknowing. And it must have been a very strange and alienating week. Um, did you notice also, by the way, it's, t- it's tonight. So um, Jesus first appeared to them last Sunday. And now this is the moment where this is what happens next. So Thomas has to live a whole week without knowing. And it must have been a very strange and alienating week for him. The other disciples were jubilant. He is certainly not. And yet he sticks with them. He's there with them. And I guess that's an observation that's worth making as well. That he has to sit with his not knowing. He is part of the community of faith, even if he doesn't share that faith. And that that might be a really important thing. That even if you're wrestling with doubt, it's hugely valuable to be in amongst the, um, the, the people of faith. It's often the faith of others that is the evidence for the truth of what we speak. You might know that faith is evidentially good for people. That um, communities of faith are happier, healthier, more generous. And that might just be coincidence, of, of course. But it's interesting that Thomas has to wrestle with his doubt, his not knowing, for a week. And that God hasn't answered the questions that he has directly or as quickly as he would like. But here we are a week later in the same place. And Jesus appears once more. In verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And the doors were locked, and Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. There might be a whole question there about how Jesus keeps appearing in these rooms with locked doors. Uh, it's It's interesting, isn't it, that John notes it without any explanation at all, as if he's saying, listen, I haven't really got anything for you here. I can't explain this at all. There's something about the resurrected Christ which means that doors are no longer an obstacle. Even the Apostle John doesn't understand how that's the case. But it seems that Jesus appeared specifically here for Thomas. So did you see? He said, peace be with you. And then he goes to Thomas and he says, here, Thomas, reach out your hand, put it in my side, feel the wounds, do not doubt but believe. First observation, do you see that Jesus asks him to choose to believe? Do not doubt, but believe. Make that choice. And I think that's really interesting because we would tend to think by modern logic that being, con- being confronted with incontrovertible evidence leaves you no choice but to believe. Do you see what I mean? If you know what I'm saying, like, how much evidence do you want for the resurrected Christ? Well, how about the resurrected Christ standing in front of you? 
that would mean that you absolutely had to believe. But it seems that that's not how it works. That belief is faith. It is always the choice that we make. It's putting your trust in something. I suppose it's the difference between, um, you know, believing that an aeroplane is capable of flying or even watching other people fly safely or getting on that plane yourself. Faith is getting on the flight. And uh, I've seen this in practice. I've seen um, that evidence is not enough, that an intellectual acceptance of the truth of faith isn't the same as the practice of faith. Jesus says you need to choose to believe. You need to choose to put this into practice. And what's really significant, I think, is that Thomas's response is not a cool-headed intellectual response to empirical evidence. He doesn't say, ah, yes, now I see. Did you see what his response was? And this is a picture of, of the response that is required from us because it's a declaration of faith and it's personal. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Do you see that what is asked of him is not abstract belief, but to put our trust in a person, to bow the knee, to say, my Lord and my God. And it's not the hard proof that convinces Thomas, but the personal encounter with the resurrected Christ that changes everything. Did Thomas get the evidence that he wanted? I don't know, actually. I think his doubt had probably been ebbing away all week. And... um, it turns out that what he needed wasn't the empirical evidence. It wasn't the, I don't know that he actually put his finger in the wounds. You know, the Caravaggio painting that we had on the service uh, sheet. It's very much Thomas is putting his finger in there. But I don't think there's any evidence in the text that he actually did that. That actually it's the encounter with Jesus, which is the thing that changes everything for him. And Jesus says to him that... Um, that he has to make this choice. That um, the point is that genuine faith is that choice that we make. We take the evidence, we, we sum up what we understand, and we choose whether we will believe. And Jesus says to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, that's a fascinating verse, because I don't know if you can hear it, but really, that's for you. That's Jesus speaking to you. Blessed are you who have not seen and have believed. Because, of course, we don't all get the same encounter as St. Thomas. We don't all get St. Paul's road to Damascus experience. And yet we all have enough evidence, if we ask for it, enough evidence to believe. Thomas's story is for those of us who struggle to believe. But ultimately, we have to learn that if we will ask and seek and knock, if we will stick with it and are open and patient, we may not get what we want, but we get what we need. And so we learn to trust and to believe. How do we do that? Well, it's unique for all of us. There isn't a formula It's a journey which is an individual one. And it's an interesting question as to what different people and different personalities require. But we learn to trust those who are witnesses. We learn to trust the quality of those who proclaim the message. We trust those who wrote it down. And we taste and see that it's good. It makes sense. It feels authentic. It fits with our understanding of the world. And we discover that God is not far from us and that reaching out, we can encounter the risen Christ. And eventually, and perhaps without fully understanding it, we are able to say, like Thomas, my Lord and my God. So we each have that same choice to make. Will we take the risk of trusting and believing? Will we take the step of faith? And when we do so, We need to then live that out. Because Thomas is sent 
as a witness to what he has seen. And with love and hope and courage, he proclaims peace to an anxious world. And we, as a community of faith, are witness to that same thing. A witness to death defeated, sins forgiven, and the truth that if God is for you, nothing can be against you. The risen Christ says to you, peace be with you. May you know the peace of that resurrected life this evening. Amen.